Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Nick DeStefano. I'm the president of the Boston chapter of UXPA. If you're unfamiliar with us, uh, we provide a forum for people in UX and related fields to share stories and an opportunity to practice on techniques and share their experiences. Uh, UXPA is an international group, and our chapter serves the greater Boston area. Membership is free for the group, and we hold various events throughout the year, um, like this, our monthly speaker series happening tonight. And our event tonight is going to be a beginner's guide to contextual inquiry with Manny Nikomi. Um, bit of a story-driven account of his first time conducting one and some of the key takeaways and his approach towards it. And then before we get into tonight's talk, just want to mention a few upcoming events we have looking at next month for June and also for July. Um, our June programming is going to be a bit more Figma focused for our monthly speaker series. We'll be doing a talk about building better UI and building it towards design systems in mind. And then if you want to go deeper into it, we'll also be doing a workshop later in the month in June, um, an in-person workshop hosted at Humana in the Boston Seaport. And then looking further on into July, our monthly speaker will be discussing conversational design experiences and how uh, ChatGPT is influencing that. And then one thing we like to do at our events too is open things up for anyone who's hiring or looking for a new role. Um, if anyone is, feel free to leave a comment in the chat. And also just want to direct people towards our updated website. We have job postings there. And also too, if you want to join our Slack group, we have a few channels to help you see postings and get some help in your search. And then before we start too, I'd also like to thank our partner for tonight, uh, Rosenfeld Media. Uh, they were able to provide us uh, five vouchers towards eBooks. And we'll be picking some of the attendees uh, later on during the talk and get in touch with you so you can use those towards ordering books. And I will fix the chat too. And I also want to introduce tonight's speaker, Manny Nkomi, a UX designer and researcher at IBM X. Uh, he has a background in design, research, and web development. And when he's not doing that, you can find him tinkering with new tech, gaming. Um, there's also a podcast too, if you want to check it out. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand things off to Manny. Hi. Hello, can you hear me okay? Okay, cool. I'm also going to turn my video on. Hopefully this works. Um, it says I can't start my video because the host has stopped it. Um, but while we're working on that, let me open my keynote. So I'm hoping you should be able to see my screen share. I'm not sure why uh, it's having some trouble resizing. And I can't see anyone. We can see your presentation. Okay, you can see it? Okay. All right, good. Um, okay, I guess we won't use video today. Um, all right, and it's full screen? Yes. Okay, great, yeah. So good evening, everyone. Happy Tuesday. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, just like some quick housekeeping stuff. Um, the presentation is about like 15 to 20 minutes long. So um, 
if you have like any questions or anything like that, I think feel free to like type them up in the chat or use the, the little Q and A section. Um, and then we'll have we'll have we should have plenty of time for discussion at the end too. Um, so a little intro about me beyond just like my speaker bio. Uh, my name is Manny. I go by he him pronouns. Um, I joined IBM in the summer of. Um, 2022 in June as an associate UX designer after graduating from Lesley University. Um, like I said earlier, my free time, I enjoy gaming and roller skating. Um, pictured here is my niece who just recently turned eight years old in April, um, which makes me cry and laugh at the same time because she's getting so old. Um, but I love teaching her how to skate um, and passing that along to her, which is really cool. Um, so a little bit about the client that I was working with to do contextual inquiry. Um, they are a heavy industrial shipbuilder and they build and maintain like various types of ships and they do really cool um, and highly complex and specialized work. And so the project that we took on with them was discovery based research into their maintenance operations. So currently the shipyard is trying to introduce new technology that will improve that. And our team was uh, tasked with discovering their processes and understanding uh, downtime at the shipyard. Um, and so we were invited on site to conduct design research and learn about their current workflows. So our humble team of three um, included another part-time user researcher who I'd worked with a little bit, um, our client side point of contact, and then yours truly. So for the contextual inquiry part, um, full context or full disclosure, I actually didn't know what I was doing was called contextual inquiry. I had heard about design research being conducted like this, but I had actually um, never known that there was like a formal term for it. Um, so basically contextual inquiry just describes like a type of ethnographic inspired field study um, that involves in-depth observation and interviews of a small sample of users to gain a more robust understanding of their workflows and behaviors. Um, and it was a method that was developed by Hugh Bayer and Karen Holtzblatt as part of their contextual design book. Um, contextual inquiry is useful because you get to see things you wouldn't anticipate and uncover some really like low level details that have become either habitual or invisible for the people that you're researching. So for example, if I was to ask you, if I was to ask someone to describe like the steps they take to make toast, they might say, I get a piece of bread, arrange them in the slots, push down on the lever, and then wait for it to be done. Um, contextual inquiry helps us kind of find out things like, well, what kind of bread do they use? Uh, what setting, if any, do they put on the toaster and such and so forth? It may also reveal things like if they use a toaster oven rather than a typical toaster, like pictured. I think Margaret Mead said it best. Um, so what people say, what people do, and what they say they do are entirely different things. So in other words, there's often a gap between what people say the steps are in an interview, for example, versus actually watching someone perform that task that you're trying to learn about. So the best time to use contextual inquiry is during like at the early project and problem discovery phases where you need a deeper understanding of the people, the processes and technologies involved. Um, and ideally, we could do this all the time as design researchers, um, but it does require a lot of time and effort. And so if your project resources are tight or if they're on a budget or you're on it solo, um, it may not be as feasible. So before going on site and doing the thing, I had to do quite a bit of prep work. This was my first time, like I said, doing research like this. So I had reached out to other IBMers in my network for advice and developed a list of areas and people and workflows of interest from my initial interviews that I did um, with other stakeholders and users that were I was going to be visiting. I also asked my client about the environment itself um, and was faced with quite a few challenges. So we had a total of five days to work with. And while on site, I was going to need things like steel toe work boots, among other kinds of PPE. Um, they also had really strict uh, security protocols, which meant I would not be able to take any photos or record video or audio, um, at least by myself. 
And so this is kind of like a huge problem because typically during a research process like contextual inquiry, you would document your observations and findings using pictures and sketches, written notes, um, videos of someone demonstrating a task, audio, anything really that you could use to collect that data. And so I was really stressed uh, trying to figure out like, how can I best document what I see, think, and hear without photos or recordings? So coincidentally, on my flight there, um, I just so happened to rewatch the movie Avatar. Um, and if you haven't watched it before, it's like a science fiction film from 2009 by James Cameron that explores the world of Pandora and the indigenous population's fight against aliens from Earth. Um, and they also just came out with a sequel, I believe, uh, the end of like 2022. And so you might be asking, like, what does Avatar actually have to do with contextual inquiry? Um, so while I was watching this, I realized um, one of the key plot points in the movie was how Earth scientists would do these field studies on Pandora's biology and indigenous cultures. And after um, their explorations in the fields, they were required to record their daily video diaries, documenting their experiences and their observations. Um, so I realized that I could use a similar method by recording daily audio journals like offsite describing things that I had saw, thought and heard throughout the day. Um, and this method wasn't exactly perfect and it's still subject to things like recency bias, but it was immensely helpful to reference in addition to all of the other notes and information that I collected when synthesizing things later. So while on site for like five days, I was learning about the people in areas of interest and workflows. I was asking questions, taking notes, recording my audio journals at the end of the day um, in my hotel room. Uh, something that surprised me was like how difficult it can be to take notes while staying engaged. Um, there were quite a few like potential trip hazards and pathways I needed to pay attention to while walking around as well. You know, when you have like heavy machinery and things and cranes lifting stuff and it kind of feels like a little chaotic in some cases. So you, you do have to be really careful depending on the environment that you're in. Um, and it was also really interesting to see how my daily recordings that I was doing went from like 20 minutes on the first day to more than like 90 minutes on the last one. And so despite all the challenges and some surprises, I made it through all five days, captured some great data points. And in the end, I basically just said, um, I'm gonna do the best I can with what I got, basically. So what I got out of this was four personas, um, an end-to-end -end service map, and a few quick, like actionable quick wins that the client can implement in the near term to improve some of their operations. Um, uh, in addition to that, one of the key stakeholders who was skeptical of UX actually came around as well. Um, and then they really appreciated how I was able to capture the process and level of accuracy and the personas. So some key takeaways. Uh, the first thing is to just share early and often and make sure that you're aligning with your stakeholders. So. I presented some of my initial findings from the interviews that I did before I came on site and shared with them like a schedule of proposed activities ahead of time with some of their input. Um, I also like had to make sure to set guardrails, especially for like interactions with participants if they were going to be with me directly. Um, and for us, we didn't really have any special type of forms in this case, because I was mostly working with employees of the company, um, but we did need to provide things like time codes for the participants. Uh, the second thing is to just plan ahead and define like who the people, the props, and the processes are that you want to look at. So know who you want to talk to and why before going there, um, and make sure you know where you want to be and what you're looking for. Um, also, like have a cheat sheet of some kind. In my case, I was lucky that my cheat sheet was a human. So this could be someone or something that you have that understands uh, some of the cultural nuances of the environment that you're going to be in, particularly terms and very specifically acronyms, because um, people will say like all these different acronyms for things, um, but you may not necessarily know what they mean. So it's good to have someone there or a little cheat sheet that kind of describes to you what those acronyms might refer to. 
It's also important to be adaptable. So during this process, um, you may be doing a mixture of traditional interview. You might be asking questions uh, while participants demonstrate a task. You might just be observing the demo without any interference. Um, and you may be doing it with a group or individuals, but preferably you will be doing this more as a one-on-one -on -one thing. Um, and also just be personable. Um, so introduce yourself and user experience. Um, when introducing myself, um, I kind of had to be prepared to explain what UX research is for people who've never heard of it before. Um, the environment that I was in, the kind of people that I was researching, they have little to no concept of like what we do as user experience designers and researchers. Um, and so this kind of tripped me up multiple times because we're so used to living and breathing in our UX bubble every day. Um, but explaining to them who you are and why you're there and what kind of work you're doing um, can kind of help you build a little bit of trust between you and the person that you're trying to collect information from. Um, and also empathize however you can. So my previous experiences, like in the printing trade as a craftsman, especially in level set with some of their craftsmen in the shipyard as well. Um, and then also show gratitude. So I spent quite a significant amount sending follow-ups to people and thank you emails to pretty much every every single person I met while I was there. Um, and it also led to some great follow-up conversation and more helpful uh, data for my research. So the last thing uh, would be, so in a perfect world, uh, bring a research buddy, um, have another researcher or note taker present so you're not doing like double duty. Um, this goes for like typical like user interviews that we do, but also very especially for something like this. Um, it enables you to focus more on what you're doing, and it also kind of helps reduce bias as well, because um, it's not just you sort of becoming um, like an unreliable narrator. Um, also, if you can, try to become like an apprentice with your participants. So learn how they do things and why from their perspective. Um, or you could also think about it like becoming an avatar, right? And then also, of course, like do your best to preserve participant privacy. Um, so in my case, my client side point of contact was with me most of the time. So we couldn't necessarily guarantee them things like anonymity, uh, but I did set some pretty strong expectations when it comes to them um, about ethics with like personally identifiable information and making sure that people honest and true answers to things without fear of like retaliation or, or any sort of thing like that. And then uh, some final parting words. Uh, um, so similar to what Mariah Carey said earlier, but stated more eloquently by Miley Angelo is to do the best you can until you know better. And then when you know better, do better. Um, and then also some of the stories and examples I was able to bring forward in my final playback were really key to understanding their everyday challenges. Um, even if they couldn't totally be quantified in some way. And as UX researchers, I think it's important for us to remember that not everything valuable is measurable. And that's basically it. Cool. Thanks for that. And you should be able to turn on video now too, or if you want. Okay, let's see. Is it on? It's working. Hello. Usually, I'm I'm used to presenting with my camera on, so that was a little awkward, but I think I think it works. So cool. And then looking at some of the Q and A, we have a few questions too. When it came to sort of setting up this project, did you have any goals or objectives or specific questions going into it? Any goals? Um, I would say probably the main objective for this was really mapping out the process that I was looking at. Um, I can't give too many like finer details of the process because this is still like ongoing client work. Um, but I would say that the majority of it was really understanding um, the various users involved and the journey from, say, like a piece of equipment going down and not working to it just being fixed and ready to go. Um, 
So there's different ways that you could represent that. Like there's user journey maps, there's service design blueprints. Um, mine was kind of a mixture of the two um, because I wanted to be able to show it as like linearly as possible. But um, that was that was probably the main goal or objective. That was probably the, the main thing that I went into it knowing that was probably going to be like a deliverable or output. Um, specific questions I also had as well. Um, those things I kind of had put out, if you saw like in some of my blurred out like mural screenshots, um, depending on what area I knew I was going to or who or what type of user I knew I was going to be talking to, um, I would come up with what I like to call like guiding questions or research questions. So they're not necessarily things I would ask a participant directly, but it's a question that I might have as a researcher and then I would reframe it or break it up into more specific questions with that person. Um, and some of it was like a list of questions that I would just have like prepared and others were just like kind of in terms of like being adaptable, just kind of going with them as they were demonstrating a process or talking about a challenge or pain point of some kind. And we got a couple of questions about some specific tasks or analyses that I've done beforehand. Now you mentioned the blueprinting and service documents. Was any task flow analysis part of what you had done? Um, to be honest, I'm not sure if task flow analysis refers to like something, some specific like research method. Um, so it's hard to say, honestly, I would, I would say no, probably not. Um, just because I don't know exactly what they're referring to. But the task flow analysis could also be exactly what I was doing. But there are multiple, the, the challenge here was that there was, there was a lot of different workflows and processes happening almost concurrently in some cases. So um, depending on who you asked and what angle, like you were looking at the problem from, some people had different, you know, perspective on things. And some people also had no idea how a particular process worked at all. Um, or I guess in this case, it's task flow. And while you were going about doing the inquiry and learning about it too, did any of your research questions change? during that short time that you had? Oh yeah, definitely. It, they definitely changed. Um, I think it's one of those things where it's like, you go in and you feel super duper prepared. And then when you get there, you're like, oh, well, everything just kind of went out the window. Um, and I would say, yeah, my, my questions and the way that I was thinking about it definitely changed while I was there, um, which kind of goes back to the whole, like the adaptable thing, right? It's like, you're gonna you're gonna be doing a mixture of these different activities, and so while you may think that you're like planned and totally prepared for this, like when you're in an environment um, that is very different and not your own, um, you may come across things that are surprising to you. You may learn something that completely changed like your perspective or your assumptions about what you were trying to research. Um, thankfully, like nothing that I encountered was like completely catastrophic to the to the point where I needed to reevaluate my entire like research and everything that I had gathered. Um, but I think I think there was some maybe specific points where I was like, oh, I might need to reframe how I think about um, the problem. So like, for example, I would say um, going into this, I assumed that like the shipyard didn't really have a lot of data to support or challenge like some of the claims that users were making or some of the interview participants or stakeholders. Um, but the more I was there on site and the more I talked with people actually, the more I realized that like they actually have a ton of data, like in fact, so much data that they don't really know what to do with it. And it's actually like creating a lot more noise for them rather than signal. And so like part of what we're doing right now is, is trying to like wrap our heads around all of the data that they have and, and understand it so that we can utilize it better um, as opposed to adding new interfaces or new processes or new things to gather data that we already have in some way or another. And now that you've gone through it too, do you have any recommendations for people interested to try and do it at their own place of work and want to try and get buy-in from the people they're working with into doing something like this? Um, like, could you could you re could you repeat the question? Yeah. Uh, how could you? 
uh, describe the benefits and effectiveness of this type of approach to help encourage some to be willing to go about it? Um, let's see. If I had to like pitch this as like a, a type of research method to like a client who knew nothing about like design research or anything like that, um, I would probably refer to these first two slides here, especially this one. Um, I think this quote kind of really like succinctly encapsulates why something like contextual inquiry is so um, useful when you are able to do it because now it's something that I, you, it's hard to understand, um, but it's once you do it and you recognize it, um, it kind of opens like your world as far as like how you would go about doing research with other people moving forward. And like now that I've done it once, or actually I've done it twice now because I did another visit um, to the shipyard like a few weeks ago, not too long ago. Um, this always kind of like pops back up in my mind. Um, you could also like look at the the toast analogy that I gave. So like a lot of people like if we if we think about user interviews, right? We do spend quite a bit of time during those interviews trying to understand from potential users, especially in a discovery process, um, like what the typical steps are in a workflow that we're trying to design for or improve or find pain points in some way. Um, but what you may not get out of that interview process is the little sticky notes that sit at the bottom right of their monitor or laptop that have like certain codes or passwords or things written. Um, you might not see the notebook on their table that contains like a step-by-step -step list or like a checklist that they use throughout the day. Um, you might not see an electronic version of that in their Outlook where they have all of their tasks and meetings in their calendar, um, which would give you a better, a much better picture and comprehensive understanding of like how they operate beyond just like what they're telling you. Um, it's hard to really quantify it, which is why I kind of, I go back to Trisha Wang's quote on, in terms of like not everything valuable is measurable. Um, but it, I think it ultimately comes down to if you want to design a better process or a better way of doing things, you really have to have an, a better in-depth understanding of how things are currently working. And contextual inquiry is like one of the best ways to do that. And when it comes to balancing you know, observations and actively interviewing people, how much did you spend on one versus the other? Um, that's a good question. So hard to quantify again, because um, it's all kind of fluid, you know, a, a observation in terms of like, not just observing people doing a specific task that you ask them, but also just kind of like, standing in a particular area or like a facility that I was in and just watching people go about their work is something that I did quite often, especially this last time that I went. Um, there may be, you're, you're kind of, when you do something like that and you're just observing without asking, you're kind of increasing, um, I guess like what you would call like the surface area for opportunity in order to find like insights and, and like crazy pain points or opportunities that you may not have otherwise like been able to find. Um, by just directly interviewing or talking with someone. I would say an ideal case scenario, like you would probably want to spend like at least 50% or more um, doing an observation interview and demo of the task. So if you're working with a participant and you say, hey, can you demonstrate this workflow for me or show me what it looks like or how you go through this process? Um, they'll like walk you through it. They'll give you like, maybe like you can ask for a high overview. Um, but what you have to be careful of is some people will kind of default to like interview mode. So they'd rather talk about it rather than showing you, um, which kind of goes back to this, which is like what people say about it and what they actually do when you're watching them are different things, right? So I found myself like sometimes needing to encourage them to actually show me what something looks like or show me the process rather than just talking about it. Um, so you want to you wanna do like probably a majority 50%. Um, or more focusing on them showing you what they do and you asking questions throughout the process um, as opposed to just defaulting to like an interview mode. Um, but it, it all ends up kind of being like a mixture of both depending on what kind of user you're, you're interviewing, what tasks you want to observe. Like some of them, it was like very physical tasks where they're either like writing on paper worksheets or something like that. It could also be like, you know, churning data in Excel 
um, SAP, like all those those sorts of things. So it, it really depends on the user, the task you want to look at, things like that. Um, but I would say like a healthy mixture of majority of it being demo, the other 25% maybe being like observation, and then 25% being like interview. And now that you have the experience, you know, having done it, do you, um, are there any examples of sort of like oops moments that come to mind or advice now of things not to do? Mm. Um, I think probably the biggest thing would be, um, having some sort of like physical media with you is probably something that I learned as particularly with the environment and group of people that I was working with. Um, it's when you're, when you're in and whether it's like the interview or the demo or doing the observation part, particularly with interviews, I think in the demos, right. When you're working with people directly, um, sometimes having things like sticky notes or index cards, um, pieces of paper, something like that, where um, you can work with them and kind of like almost kind of like set up like a pseudo like workshop of some kind where, you know, after they demonstrate the task and you talk to them about it, you kind of like play that back to them or you like draw a diagram, um, you have them draw a diagram of it, like things like that. That's something that I didn't do as much the first time that I went. And that's something that I regretted doing and that I tried to do more of the second time that I went and did some similar um, work was having some sort of physical media with me and like pens and, and paper that people could draw or write on. Um, and those actually become really useful artifacts that you can um, show in some of your report up materials as well, as far as like what the user's sort of mental model is for a particular process or a piece of information. And looking back overall, how long would you say it took for planning to execution and analysis? Hmm, like the whole thing from planning and execution analysis. Um, I would say in total, I think it took about two months. Um, yeah, I think it was roughly two months. Uh, but within that time, I could have also been working on other things as well. So it's not necessarily like a duration. It's more of like from start to end, like when I started planning for it and when I actually delivered the report out, the the whole process, I think, was about a two month turnaround, give or take. Um, so like about eight weeks. But yeah, I could I could have been doing other things during that time besides planning for it and, and doing the report out. Do we have any other questions from the group? All right, so thanks Manny. Thanks for taking the time to walk us through it and answer our questions. Awesome, yeah, this thank you for having me. This is great. Really great questions this, also. Cool, at this point too, I'd like to announce the names for our winners of the raffle too. And I'll be in touch with people after as well. But we have Adam Lee, Iram Ozekis, Sam Tan, Malcolm Keanu, and Makinsai Lamar as our winners for tonight. So I'll be in touch after to get you hooked up with those vouchers so you can get your eBooks. And thanks again for everyone who joined us. And don't forget to check our website too, uxpaboston.org for upcoming events, at job postings and other news from us too. Thank you everyone. Thank you.